Um, well, as you all know by now, I like non-traditional thinkers. I like people who can look at our fast-paced world um, and find uh, not just insight, but opportunity and latent talent. Um, and I want to invite the author of the book, Signals, um, Pippa Malgren, uh, up onto the stage in a moment, who is an economist, but also a drone entrepreneur. And I have to say, that's a fairly unusual combination that even in my world, I don't tend to bump into very often. So Pippa, why don't you come up and tell us um, a bit about how you like to look at the world and the unique lens that you have. Thank you. So today and yesterday, many of you chatted with me and said, you're the one who's going to talk about the economy? That's scary. So what I want to do with you today is tell you what is happening on the global landscape that you need to be aware of to understand the economic forces that are in play, mainly good, in my opinion, some tricky, but all we need to be aware of. And one of the things that I find is that in my profession, in the world of economics and finance, the whole community has been wrong. It's incredible that for the last decade, people have missed every single major event. They missed the financial crisis, they missed the slowdown in China, they missed the recovery in the US, they missed Brexit, they missed Trump, and they missed the return of inflation. So none of you need to be intimidated by, sorry, none of you need to be intimidated by finance and economics. The problem in my world is that everyone is blind in one eye. They love to look at data and numbers and quantifiable outcomes. But that's only half the picture. And you in this audience are uniquely qualified because what you have is an eye, an eye for trends, an eye for what's happening in the world economy. The question is whether you trust it enough. And so I put up this image to try to get you to remember that you need to open both eyes and then tell us, the rest of the world, what you see. Because as you'll see when I come to the conclusion, you are going to tell us where the world economy is going, not vice versa. Let me put it this way. I have several very big views. Now, all of the events I just described, it happens, I manage to predict them. This is not because I'm smarter than anyone else. It's just because I started to look at indicators that weren't purely financial. So what are my predictions today? Number one, Mexico is the new China. And that is going to be a huge issue for your industry to think about. Number two, inflation is a real phenomena. It is back on the table, and it's going to touch every one of your markets, your customers, and it will touch you and your costs. So we have to think about inflation. Three. The markets are actually poised to get much stronger. This is exactly the opposite view that most people in my world have. What most people have is a high degree of uncertainty, a deep sense of unease. So I want to walk you through why I see such a positive and optimistic outcome. Uh, inflation. Inflation is changing the landscape, and it is giving us the most important public policy in the world today, which is China's strategy called One Belt, One Road. I think you, this audience in particular really needs to Google this, to look at it, to understand it. Here's what's happened. The Chinese workers have felt the price of food and rent and other basic elements of life go up quite dramatically ever since we had every major central bank in the world for the last decade do everything possible to create inflation. They lowered interest rates to record low levels. They flooded the markets with cash in programs called things like quantitative easing that nobody really understands. What it is is throwing money at the economy. 
The Americans did it. The British did it. The Japanese, the Chinese, frankly, even the Europeans. Never in history have we seen so much money thrown at the world economy simultaneously. So prices start to rise, because that's the whole point. They start to rise in emerging markets first. So the Chinese workers have been faced with rising cost of living. And as a result, they've said, no, 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 I cannot work for this small amount anymore. I need to be paid more. So their wages have gone up by five times in the last three years, enough so that they are not as competitive as they were. Some would even argue this is an existential problem. In fact, the leadership in China believe it's no longer a question of waiting for the world economy to get better, and China will then get lifted as well. No, because now wages in Mexico are 20 to 30 percent cheaper than they are in China. The most attractive location on the entire planet for capital today is the Mexico-Texas Midwest Corridor, a part of the world that, in my opinion, the fashion and luxury goods world doesn't really think that much about. And yet, that is where capital is being deployed, that's where profits are being made, and I think that's where a huge amount of wealth is being generated. But more importantly, it means for the Chinese, they have to completely rethink what is their future. Just to give you clarity on this, the iPhone in your pocket is made by Foxconn. Foxconn is the second largest employer in China with 1.2 million employees. Foxconn has announced their intention to make these things in Pennsylvania. When Pennsylvania is more competitive than Shenzhen, something big is happening in the world economy that we need to pay attention to. Apple has announced its intention to bring production back into the United States. By the way, both well before Donald Trump came along, so he can try and claim credit for this, but the fact is, economics was driving this before he even arrived. But it's really important, and it explains this map. One belt, one road. Do not forget it. The Chinese leadership have realized they cannot generate GDP at home. They have to create economic income outside the country, special economic zones outside of China. If they're going to dub double national incomes by 2020, which is what Xi Jinping has promised the public, then they're going to have to find a way to generate that wealth somewhere else. Also, they have loads of excess capacity, steel, concrete, labor. They have to find a place to put it to work. So One Belt, One Road is a series of physical pathways. It's the biggest infrastructure build the world has ever seen. It opened with an institution called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, in May, so it's very new, with a balance sheet that is larger than the World Bank on its first day of operation. It is a physical pathway that goes from eastern China all the way through Central Asia into the Middle East, even here in Oman. Uh, there's a port that's being built. We're going to go from a fishing village of 10,000 people at Dakum to one of the world's largest tourism and uh, commercial ports in the world. That is a one belt, one road phenomena. It goes into Western Europe, and just so we really understand the magnitude of this thing and that it's not hypothetical, it's right now. The two longest railway journeys in history have just been completed. One was done a year ago from Yiwu in eastern China all the way to Madrid. The second was just completed in December from Yiwu all the way to London. The Yiwu London train now goes once a week. It takes 18 days. It's a physical pathway connecting China with the rest of the world. It's roads, it's bridges, it's railway links. But it's also maritime. And the maritime link, you'll see, goes around Asia, around India, into the Middle East, and frankly, around Africa, and now around Latin America. You may have heard the Chinese have said that they're committed to creating a new canal in Nicaragua. 
punching a hole smack through the middle of the country in order to create something parallel to the Panama Canal. They're widening the Suez Canal here in this region. So this is a very, very big project. And the whole purpose of the project is to be able to reach for the resources that China needs to feed its people, to provide the energy that's required in a world where they expect inflation will continue to grow. And this is why I think you need to pay attention to it, because it isn't going to be just goods that travel on these pathways. It's going to be ideas. It's going to be wealth. And it's going to be the creation of entirely new markets that we haven't really thought about before. One Belt, One Road is a central issue in the world economy, also because it creates geopolitical problems or geopolitical issues. Again, just so you clearly understand the current state of things, you may have read about the South China Sea and the stress between the United States and China there. In fact, I think, Sophie, you even showed a picture of uh, one of the areas where there's great dispute, a little place called Fiery Cross, perhaps aptly named, uh, where the Chinese are building physical infrastructure in the middle of the South China Sea. The real issue is, if China can't feed its people, which it can't because it doesn't have enough arable land or water to do so, then it has to go find these raw materials like food. Now, what do they see when they look out over the South China Sea, which has 10% of the world's fish supply right there off their coastline in a world where protein prices are rising? They see the US Navy. And so we start to have stress between the two sides. I'll finish on this point. A year ago in December, Xi Jinping and President Obama signed a memorandum of understanding between the two countries that prohibits the military pilots who are flying the American spy planes and the Chinese fighter jets from quite literally making obscene hand gestures at each other while flying. How close do you have to be to see the other guy's obscene hand gesture in a fighter jet? And the answer is 20 to 40 feet. That's how close America and China are. And that was before Donald Trump arrived. So, that's the scariest bit of what I'm going to say. But it's important that you're not unaware of these stresses. I could talk about them with regard to Russia as well. I won't take the time to do that now. But I think it's really important uh, that you understand the landscape. I also want to say that given the picture that I've just presented, you also need to think very carefully about who is your competition. What is a luxury good in the modern world economy where there's a high degree of uncertainty? I've put up an image of the genetic code because now we're going to have medicines that are created for your specific genetic makeup. We're going to have a world in which you can actually take a pill that will allow you to know all the works of Shakespeare. And if that sounds crazy, let me say that Nicholas Negroponte, who founded the MIT Media Lab, has very consistently been saying, we are so close to this. The innovation that's occurring in the world economy today is not to be underestimated. I remember when Coca-Cola realized its biggest competitor wasn't Pepsi. Its biggest competitor was a candy bar or potato chips, probably things this audience, come to think of it, is not terribly familiar with now that I mention them. But here's the thing for you. What is your nearest competitor, whether you're making perfumes or you're making incredible gowns? It may be a genetic solution to a health problem. It may be that one has to trade taking a pill that will allow me to speak Mandarin tomorrow from having a dress that might cost the same. I think in economics, the innovation aspect is so immense, it requires our attention. RFID chips. Let me very quickly run you through this piece of the innovation. RFID chips are one-third of the size of the dimple of a golf ball. They are embedded in most of the clothes that we wear today, at least that are made on high streets. Certainly not at the haute couture end, but nonetheless. They're important because they allow governments and they allow companies to triangulate on the information about you. I'm very glad Sophie gave her talk because that set the stage for what I'm about to say. 
one of the most important events in the world economy is that inflation has begun to generate social unrest. We see it in China, for example. One way China is seeking to solve that problem is by clamping down on dissent. RFID chips are part of this process. Clothing is part of this process. So they have announced their intention to create a kind of new Uber score for individuals. And what that means is that your RFID chips in your clothes will triangulate now with the signature in your cell phone, with the CCTV cameras. And if you borrow your mother's car and she has a, a disabled parking permit and you pull into that spot to drop off a package, it will clock that you have done this. And that will affect your ability to get a job, your ability to have a mortgage. This kind of social engineering aspect, I think, is going to be very important in the world economy. It's also connected to the introduction of electronic money and blockchain. These are very important things, and you have to imagine a world where this is really possible, where every transaction is recorded. There is no black economy anymore. There is no offshore money anymore. That much of the wealth of your customer base is going to be affected by this new world. India just announced that they moved a billion people from cash to electronic money with no warning whatsoever. The prime minister just came up one day and said, we start now, and three weeks later, they were done. This is real today. Technology is also going to influence what you are all making. I won't spend too long on this because Sophie did cover this quite a lot, but in short, even clothes are going to start reflecting what technology can make possible. This is an example of Marquesa with IBM Watson, where the dress actually reflected the emotions of the crowd as they watched the dress. Suddenly, our definition of what is innovation in luxury becomes something very different than we thought. Now, I want to finish very quickly because I'm running out of time. This is the perfume Joy. It is a perfect example of what you and your industry are capable of and what the world needs. In 1929, when we had the financial market crash, Jean Patou realized he had lost his entire customer base. And he decided to launch the most expensive perfume ever made into that nightmare of a market that is nothing what we have today compares to that disaster. It was the most successful launch in history. It's been the second most successful perfume in history after Chanel No. 5. I wanted to point out, by the way, Chanel No. 5 was a mistake, right? The chemist actually put in 10 times the number of aldehydes that were required. And we've been using aldehydes in our perfume ever since. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. That is part of the process of reaching success. My very last thing on this. I open by saying your decisions will define the economy that we're going to have tomorrow. When Christian Dior introduced the new look, the idea that you could put that much fabric in a skirt was shocking. But what it did is it signaled to the world that the era of rationing and deprivation was over, that there would be enough going forward. And I do think today what we need from your community is more conviction about what does the future look like, because that will define it. I put a bunch of different articles up on Twitter and Facebook and social media on exactly the things I've talked about. I'll just say one last thing. When you open both your eyes and you look at signals as well as quantitative data, fashion is a great place to look. And right now, I just wanted to say as my very last thing, in economics, we have a bit of a cliche. We say, when hemlines are long, the economy is bad. When hemlines are short, the economy is good. I think it's fascinating today that the fashion world is signaling asymmetric headlines. I'm like, and I have to say, I didn't put up a picture because I thought it would disturb some people in the audience, but Melania Trump, on election day, she wore this dress that started here and went asymmetric all the way to the floor. And I thought, you know what it signals? Uncertainty. It signals uncertainty. 
in a world where actually, I think we're on the brink. If you think how much money has been thrown at the world economy, most of my clients, big institutional investors, families, they have 35% cash just sitting there. Well, if we have inflation, it can't stay in cash. It's got to go into the markets, and that's where it's going to go, which means I think we're looking at a world where between China and an effort to create inflation, we're going to have a better world economy than we've had. But what we need is the direction from your industry to have that conviction and to show us what is the future going to look like. I'll stop with that. Thank you very much.